Hi, welcome back to my channel, Manga Hoarder. My name is Laura. Today I am going to be wrapping up a couple of recent reads. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Storm Fairy by Osamu Tezuka. I'm going to be talking about 5 centimeters per second by Makoto Shinkai. And I'm going to be talking about uh, Satoshi Kon's Opus. Now, um, these are all titles that I had wrapped in my January TBR unwrapping. Um, that's a project my sister and I are doing where we're trying to read through some of the titles that we have been ignoring, that have been in our collection for a long time. So if you want to see that unwrapping, I think it's quite fun to do. Um, the playlist will be linked up down below. Um, so what I'm planning to do, and um, since this is my first sort of wrap up this year, even though it's going to be in March for, you know, how late, how late am I getting to things? Um, since this is my first wrap-up, I thought I would sort of share a little bit of like the house cleaning of what I'm planning to do with wrap-ups and then we'll get into talking about these books. Um, so basically what I thought I would do is I will talk about all of the books that I unwrap in that unwrapping project and um, I might talk about other books as well, but I really wanted to um, eliminate any sort of need to talk about everything I read. Um, I'm also not planning on talking about books on a monthly schedule. Um, like, I'm hoping to talk about books every month, but I'm not planning on doing monthly wrap-ups. I'm just going to wrap up books as I want to wrap them up, as I want to group them. I'm going to try and keep the wrap-ups in a pretty small order, um, and that way I have a chance to talk about the books a little bit, um, and also that the videos don't get extraordinarily long, which they tend to do. Um, so that's basically what my plan is, is to be talking about all of the books I unwrap. Um, if you have watched those unwrapping videos, you know that my sister also participates in this, and I have had comments on my videos saying, I can't wait to hear your sister's thoughts on that. Um, you're going to be waiting a long 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 time um, because she won't be sharing her thoughts on books she is just going to participate in that video with me um, it was sort of an agreement between us that if she wanted to do an unwrapping with me she had to be on camera so um, I the, the agreement didn't go any further than that and she doesn't want to make uh, videos which is totally her own prerogative um, but if you do want to see what she is reading and she reads quite a lot more than I do she does post every single book that she reads on Instagram. She just doesn't share her thoughts on books, um, which is fine. She shares them with me. Yeah. Anyway, but I'm going to share my thoughts with you, and hopefully that's okay, too. The first title I'm going to talk about is 5 centimeters per second. This is by Makoto Shinkai and art by Yukiko Seike. Um, it was translated by Melissa Tanaka, and it was serialized in Afternoon Magazine by Kodansha from 2010 to 2011. The entire series has been published in a single volume in English, so it is very easy to collect. Um, and what else do I have to say? I think that's sort of like the housekeeping. Um, it is just shy of 500 pages, so it's not a terribly long, like I would say it's probably the equivalent of two Tankobon uh, volumes. So this is basically the story of um, a guy and his relationship with a girl. Um, it's not necessarily a romance, or maybe it's more like a romance about romance. Um, it is uh, a story about a girl who transfers into elementary school. Um, she is immediately befriended by the guy um, because he also has been a recent new transfer and he knows what it feels like and so they have an instant connection, they become instant best friends, um, and they soon uh, fall in love with each other. Um, of course when you're that young um, your family kind of dictates the direction that your life is gonna go and so her family, her father I think, is transferred um, again and so she has to leave school um, but they are still kind of relatively nearby so they they can't necessarily see each other but they they do write letters and things you know knowing that there's sort of a short distance between the two of them and then of course he gets the news that his parents are transferred or his father I don't know who which of his parents is transferred but they have to leave um, and they're going quite a bit more further 
a field. Um, and so it kind of takes away their their um, distant connection, like even though they haven't been seeing each other this whole time, knowing that you could get on the train to see each other um, kind of makes you feel like you were a little bit closer, but this takes away that connection. After, you know, the transfer, um, the feelings between these these characters um, begin to fade. The, the distance uh, preys on their relationship and their age. Um, so even though it was such an impactful and important relationship, and it continues to be an impactful and important relationship, um, it, you know, time, um, distance, and um, age really play into whether or not you can sustain a relationship, no matter how strong you think it is. Um, and so the story continues kind of from that moment, um, just focusing on um, his story and then kind of uh, a few of the relationships that he has over the course of the next several years until I think even after college. Um, and kind of how this original relationship that he had with this girl um, how it continues to impact um, any any of his relationships with other people and so it really is a story about kind of like uh, development of feelings the way that feelings change over time um, kind of a loss of love or loss of your innocence um, and I think you really see that um, and you know that from the very first page. Um, initially, the second you open this book, you see that they are walking along and there are cherry blossom trees or sakura um, lining the streets. This is uh, very significant um, here. The very first two pages um, I can show you. And um, you know that when a sacra blossom, particularly when it is dropping its petals, you know that that is symbolic of um, kind of the end of something, the fleeting of time, the end of seasons. Um, you know, sacra uh, bloom really quickly, um, but they also drop their their petals very soon after. Um, the title five centimeters per second refers to the speed at which a petal. Uh, drops from a tree um, and it's so the entire story is wound up in this this symbolic um, idea of um, you know fleeting you know time is fleeting relationships are fleeting life is fleeting so things that are ending um, you know it has sort of like a romantic kind of sweet undertone but at the same time like it's about the end of something um, and, you know, I think it was successful at pulling it off. Um, I think Shinkai kind of knows how to write this story. I have read two other manga written by Shinkai, I think based off of his anime. One is Voices of a Distant Star. The other one is She is Her Cat. She and Her Cat. I can't remember what it's called. Um, and, you know, Shinkai is mostly known for writing these um, kind of personal or dramatic stories about kind of loneliness and loss and, you know, fleeting of time and space and distance. So um, I think that, that those are such common themes for his writing that, um, you know, you can't be anything but successful in, in putting those elements together. I haven't ever seen um, actually, I, no, I, I'm lying. I have seen Voices of a Distant Star, but I haven't seen any of his more modern films, and I know he's a very popular filmmaker. I do think that this story is impacted by that. Um, I think that there are elements that are missing that you really don't get unless you have kind of background scene or action or movement, or even just sort of some of the fill-in from, um, from an anime um, and so I, th I feel like when I was reading this manga that I was missing a little bit and that I should have watched the anime first, um, especially since this manga is based on the anime and not the reverse. Um, it always means that, like, anime is always so condensed anyway, and then to take that and condense it into a manga always means that you're really losing something in the narrative. Um, so I felt like it was, it was lacking. Um, quite a bit, and so that emotional impact that you're supposed to get from his stories, I felt actually quite, I don't know, stunted. I didn't really feel that, that emotion, and 
I think that if I had watched the anime, it would have been significantly more powerful as a story, at which I think it was sort of aiming to be, um, but it just sort of missed that uh, for me. What would have been nice, um, since the anime is just a film, is if this book had extended beyond the film and it had told maybe her point of view as well and both of their development um, into adulthood and how that story or how that original relationship has impacted both of them. You get a glimpse of her story um, throughout but it's just a glimpse. Um, it really would have been great. Like I feel like it would have been more impactful and more of a robust story if there was more to it. Um, so I think it was a good book um, but it certainly wasn't my uh, it certainly hasn't been my favorite of his so far. Uh, the next title that I'm going to talk about is Storm Fairy. This is by Osamu Tezuka. This is actually a series of short stories um, and they are all uh, shoujo manga, so aimed at young girls. Um, I certainly don't think they're aimed at teenagers. I think young girls. There's a variety of stories but they all kind of take on fantasy elements um, and some even fairy tale elements so it makes uh, for an interesting reading experience. Storm Fairy was serialized in Shoujo Book Magazine from September 1955 to March 1957. Um, there's a second story called The Kokeshi Detective Agency which was serialized in Nakayoshi Magazine April to December 1957 and then The Pink Angel which is the third story was serialized in Shoujo Book Magazine from April 1957 to February 1958. So um, each of these stories has um, kind of different lengths to them. Um, the first one, which is Storm Fairy, and it is the title story of this compilation, um, is, is a very fairy tale-esque type story. It's about a complex that is being attacked the lady of the house, um, her husband stays behind but she is rescued and so she runs into a crone in the woods and says, you know, can you save my husband? Um, and the, the crone says, well, I'll make this agreement with you, I'll rescue your husband, but only if the first child that you give birth to will be born with the face of my child and my child will be born with the face of your child. Um, of course, the crone is an ugly woman and so um, she, let's see, you can't really, you don't really get a good sense of her, but she is an ugly woman, so she's of course going to have an ugly child. So of course, um, the husband is saved, and she does give birth, and her child is born with an ugly face. Um, but the crone's child is born um, as a you know, beautiful fairy, um, which is uh, I think the Storm Fairy, I think that's probably where her name comes from. The fairies in the the wilderness are mischief makers and so they're trying to um, cause bad things to happen but possibly because she has a pretty face she isn't a good at being that kind of fairy and so even though she causes a little bit of mischief she actually wants to cause good and so ends up helping people. Um, the the princess or whatever that is born with an ugly face, um, she is kept um, looking beautiful by them putting a mask on her and so she wears a beautiful mask um, everywhere. Um, and a situation happens basically where because she's wearing a mask, because no one knows what she looks like, she is uh, deposed without her parents knowing and replaced with um, another child pretending to be her um, who was wearing a mask and who takes advantage of the position. And so uh, Storm Fairy as well as some other um, people that she's run into along the way, they help her get her, uh, get back to her home. Uh, help her defeat the bad guys basically. Um, it has a very um, fairy tale type story. Of course it has sort of like the the agreement to, to rescue you, the, the bad arrangement that you aren't thinking about, um, and then the solution um, usually requires some sort of a sacrifice. So it it definitely follows uh, fairy tale, like European fairy tale tropes. Um, I thought it was the best story in this compilation by far, um, certainly because it at least follows something that I'm familiar with and seemed like it at least had a little bit of um, metal 
The second story was called The Kokeshi Detective Agency. It was actually a series of a number of short stories all starring a, I can't remember if she's third or fourth grader, um, and she is just not afraid of anything and so she sets up a detective agency and helps people solve mysteries. They're very childlike mysteries, um, you know, what's that sound that's always coming from the window, um, you know, things of that nature. So she, because she's not afraid, she's willing to find out what those things are. Um, she, you know, helps bring down gangsters, etc. Um, it's very cute, but I think also very um, incomplete and I think very naive at, like, what what girls want to actually read. Like, it just seemed very um, simple and uncomplicated and, I don't know, um, just sort of really, really basic. And I, I think maybe just sort of a, a vision of, of what writing was like at the time. But uh, yeah, it was, wasn't my favorite. Um, the third one, uh, the third story was better, at least it's it's probably the one that I thought the most about. Um, it's called Pink Angel and it was about a cloud. It was like a sun sunrise cloud, I think, or a sunset cloud. Um, and she can kind of transform into anyone and she goes around on, on the earth helping people out even though the, I can't remember what sunrise or sunset clouds have a battle going on with the storm clouds and the storm clouds are saying you know you can't you don't belong here you shouldn't be here um, and you know she could get herself into a lot of trouble being there um, there she kind of plays herself off as human and does things to help but also gets people into trouble because she's helping um, you know she she's like got a good heart but she's you know not always doing what's right um, so it's kind of cute and interesting in that way um, just sort of like the mischief and how she helps out. The situations are, can be kind of extreme, like there's one where she helps out a child who's being abused by her aunt and uncle. There's, there's some like interesting harder situations that are happening but they're not presented in a difficult way at all um, or in a complicated way at all. So like they're cute, they're fun, they definitely feel like really cheesy, you know, 1930s cartoons. 1930s, 1940s cartoons. Um, so they, they don't really have a lot, a lot to them. It was fun to read, um, but, you know, early shoujo manga written by men, I just, they feel like they're written for, like, babies. They don't, these don't really feel like uh, strong stories about strong girls, even though, like, um, you know, they all are stories about girls who help out, who do good. Um, you know, the one in the middle with the detective agency, she's smart and brave. Like, it, they, they, the girls do have good qualities, but it just, it really doesn't feel like they're very complex or complete. And I think even in Osama Tezuka, his men are, are much more solidly written, and I, I think they're much better characters, or at least they have more nuances. This, this, these ones are just really, really basic. And it might just be the fact that he is writing for a younger audience. I thought they were okay, um, but not my favorite works of his by far. I think even some of his other shoujo works that I've read, like uh, Twin Nights, is much better or at least much more interesting. Um, the other thing about his work is that normally when you read it, like I always find that his panel layout or his art um, can be experimental and so there'll be some interesting uh, movement or you know he'll play with lines a little bit or he'll play with the shapes of the panels um, or directions of characters uh, drawings. Um, he really didn't look like he was experimenting or having any fun with the drawing. It was like I have a job here, I'm just going to do the job. I'm not, he doesn't really look like he's interested um, in the work that he's writing. So that also, I think, impacts your feelings about a work or impacted my feelings about the work. Um, the last book I want to talk about is Satoshi Kon's Opus, um, written and illustrated by Satoshi Kon. This one is translated by Zach Davison. Um, and this was serialized in Comic Guys magazine from 1995 to 1996. Um, it is an incomplete work. Um, at the same time, it does have a conclusion. So I think there is enough of an end that you will 
want to read this. Um, at least I, th I thought it was satisfying enough. I think it's more interesting that it is incomplete. Um, this is basically the story of a man who is a mangaka or an, a manga author. He is just about to finish his like very popular uh, adventure manga. Um, you know, is just putting the finishing touches on it. Um, where one of the characters in his manga kind of becomes aware of the fact that they're in this manga, or becomes aware of um, where the story is going for them, um, and in that final page they are killed. And so that character decides to take it upon themselves to steal the final page of the manga um, and hide it from the mangaka. And of course he has some issues with that um, in in this way he is also pulled into the manga and so you get um, a visual of what it likes what it's like um, in the creative process of writing a manga he has conversations with his characters who are um, kind of confused about his role kind of confused about who he is and why he's there and you know of course having a a crisis about about their own kind of purpose because um, you know if you are created and someone is writing your story do you have any free will at all so they do kind of go into that discussion um, a little bit um, so of course he is in in the manga trying to get his page back um, and they get caught up in the fight between um, the fight between the good guys in this in the series as well as the bad guy with this weird a mask character which you actually see here on the cover. I personally found the mask character to be really irritating and kind of um, kind of a boring villain um, but you are thrust into this story um, not having seen the rest of the manga so you already you you are missing kind of like the connection between all these characters you're kind of discovering them as he is trying to talk to all the characters and, and get his his story back um he does kind of pop back out into the real world and then pop back into the manga um and so it really is there's a lot of interesting conversation in it more about like how you write manga how you pr approach writing manga how your characters begin to write themselves. Even like the experience of the world is only the vision of that 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 mangaka is giving you. You don't actually see everything. So there's some really interesting ideas in it. Um, in addition to that, the art in it is uh, spectacular. There's some really wonderful uh, plays on dimension and movement in it. Um, there's a lot of, of things like um, opening the pages, um, ideas of, of you know, incomplete drawings in the background um, and how those those work. Um, I thought it was really, really wonderful, the art style. Um, and the style itself, um, when you open it, if you've read any uh, Katsuhiro Otomo, who wrote Akira, you'll recognize the art style immediately. It is, um, in my opinion, I had to double check to make sure that Otomo didn't draw it because it is so incredibly similar. Um, of course, um, Satoshi Kon did work with Otomo and did actually like really closely worked with Otomo so not only was strongly influenced and respected him but also worked uh, really closely so his art style I think um, is indicative of that um, and just like uh, Makoto Shinkai who we already talked about um, you know Satoshi Kon is also known for being a um, manga director or an anime director and so his films are all really beautiful um, and so this also has that sense of, of uh, film quality writing um, you know you can see more about like where the camera angles are rather than just up close of people's faces and no backgrounds this one has solid background solid um, you know space and dimension and action and movement um, all that stuff is really present um, in it because you can really draw from your experience as an animator so I think a lot of that is present and I thought it was a really wonderful manga. Now it ends quite abruptly um, and then at, after the kind of abrupt end um, it ends because uh, the the director did pass away. Um, there is sort of a short uh, short story that was included in this that was never published so it's just um, original line drawings 
and it goes into the story um, basically of Satoshi Kon taking his this manga to the editor um, and kind of finding out that it's been cancelled and apologizing to people for for the the incomplete work and so it was really interesting reading that not because he was like kind of finishing it and kind of taking some loose ends and, and trying to tie it up for his fans but more because the first part of the manga is really meta manga it's manga about manga um, and then the end of the manga is a manga about manga about manga like it is super meta um, it is so interesting to read all the complexities of it you know I originally thought that the first manga cow gets pulled into his manga it's supposed to be um, symbolic of Satoshi Kon but then Satoshi Kon does actually write himself into the manga at the end it was fantastic I thought it was so interesting um, the actual story that the mangaka gets pulled into I don't think is that good or interesting myself but um, all the ideas about manga um, and how beautiful the art is and how dynamic everything is I thought it was was great I really really enjoyed reading Opus. Um, yeah, I will have a lot of fun reading this one again um, and getting more out of it. it was was a lot of fun. So these are the three manga that I just talked about. Let me know if you have read any of them or if you're planning to read any of them. I actually enjoyed reading all of them. Obviously Satoshi Kon's Opus was my favorite, um, but these ones were also uh, good interesting reads and I would recommend checking out any of them if you have a chance. Anyway, I think that's it. Thanks so much for watching my channel and I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.